Word of Christ, welcome back. We're so excited to continue on on this series on James 21. Last week was incredible. This week, it gets even better. So we're so glad to have you with you. We're continuing with this focus on understanding the power of the tongue. And this week specifically, we're looking at how the scripture refers to the fiery serpent on the cross. And maybe that almost sounds a little strange to you, maybe it sounds a little weird, um, but you will fully get it. I promise you, you'll fully get it um, in the short 40 minutes that we're doing here on this video. So open your heart, open your mind. God has something amazing for you this week, and we so look forward to getting into it. Please stay with us. At the end of this, we really bring some interesting topics of discussion, and I have a personal message for many of you here at the end of this video. So make sure to stay with us. God bless you, family. Welcome with me, Rose, and let's get right into it. We'll see you on the other side. Hello, everyone. This is Rose Romandi, and welcome back to the Book of James study. We are continuing our study on the Book of James, chapter 3. In this video, we are going to continue looking at the tongue as the serpent. In the previous video, we looked up some scriptures together, and we saw that the tongue is the unruly serpent. But let's just take a look at chapter 3 again one more time. So starting in chapter three in the book of James, we are, James is just bringing multiple examples for us to understand the, you know, the uh, working of the tongue in our midst, okay? So, but we shouldn't forget that as we are talking about the tongue, we are actually going to see how this is connected to the faith and to production of the faith. Because we started the book of James by this, and throughout this series, I have been saying it over and over and over again, that James is trying to help us to move on to perfection and to live a life that is fruitful and brings that, you know, fruit of the spirit or the perfection that faith uh, has for us. So basically, James is trying to help us to perfect faith in order to be able to produce something and receive uh, something and or live in um, in a place or in the identity that God has uh, you know um, planned us or had has designed us for. So that's why today we are going to see. Let's just uh, let me just bring up my screen here. And we are going to take a look at a couple of scriptures. So, as we are reading the book of James together, we realize that, you know, maybe I should change my color uh, just because sometimes it's have the black color. <laughs> it's better. All right. So, what happens is here, um, the James is talking about the untamed tongue. Okay, so what we saw so far that James is telling, he brought the example of the horse. I'll talk to you about it in the next video. And then he brought the example of the ships that they go to the sea. And as we go to verse 7, he brought the example of beasts. He brought the example of birds and the reptiles. Okay, and he also the creature of the sea. All right, and then as you continue, he goes and he says, uh, look at verse um, eight again. It says, no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Okay, so we looked at it in the previous video. Therefore, tongue is that evil or the beast or all of these but it's full of poison okay i'm just gonna write this down but now let's continue reading look at verse 9 it says uh, with it we bless um, our god and father and with it we uh, and with it we we curse man who have been made in the uh, similitude of God. So I'm going to write here. So tongue is a member or something that does blessings plus cursing. 
that's that's what I'm going to talk about today mostly. Look at verse um, Look at verse 10. It says, Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Do you see? Proceeds blessing and cursing. So this is really important. It's not the or, it's and. Okay? So tongue. Tongue here. Let me just, just put it here. Tongue is evil because it has the blessing and cursing we usually think when there is cursing alone then it's evil but here says you know what the tongue is evil because the tongue has the blessing and cursing at the same time but now look at take, take a look at verse 11 it says does a spring send forth fresh water and be their water from the same opening. So I'm going to write down up on top here. So it's talking a spring again is another example of tongue. Okay. Now look at this. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? So now we are coming to a, an example that our brother is using. And it is the example of a tree. So it says, can a fig tree produce, produce olives? Can a fig tree or a grapevine bear figs? Are we going to have a tree that is going to be producing two different kinds of fruits? Okay, so he's talking about the tree here. In the previous video, we saw how the tongue is actually that serpent in Genesis chapter 3. And if you haven't watched the video, please go and watch it because I'm building upon one another as we are moving and getting deeper in understanding of this. So now, did you see blessing and cursing? Now, and then it says the fig tree. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, hopefully we all know the story of the woman and the serpent that comes to the woman and you look at um okay so uh look at verse five you know what let's take a look at the verse four then the serpent said to the woman you will not surely die for god knows that in that day that you eat of it um, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and, do you see, good and evil. So now I'm going to come here. So blessing and cursing, it, can, it is good and evil. So serpent said, this is the nature of God. God is both good and evil he knows good and evil but now and unfortunately we see this happening many times in christianity that people are still believing in what the serpent said but here james tells us guys there is no tree that is going to be produced two things. We don't have the spring that produce the fresh water and the bitter water. We don't have a tree that is going to produce, or we have the tree, but the tongue of man as the symbolic of the tree that is going, that is producing two things. We are, the tongue wasn't supposed to be, this is evil. So this is the good and evil. It's not actually God. It's actually evil right so so what do we have here god told them in genesis chapter 3 do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil okay do you see it says do not eat from a tree that produces two kinds of fruit do not eat from the fruit of a tree that produces two kinds of food. Uh, the two kinds of food. What are we seeing here? Remember that Jesus said, "Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks." 
And then right before that, he says, you know, every tree with the fruit. So therefore, we have a fruit called good and evil, and there is a fruit that is called life. So therefore, our tongue, our tongue, it's that fruit, fruit bearing. Let me just put it this way. The blessing and cursing, they are the fruit of the tree. The blessing and cursing, they are the fruit of the tree. The good and evil, they are the fruit of the tree. So therefore, what, what is it trying to say? It says, you know what? The moment you bring your, you know, um, when your tongue starts blessing and cursing, yes and no, that becomes, that, ex that is the nature of evil. Okay, so that's the nature of evil and that shouldn't be. So James tells us that ought not to be. Okay, why? Because the apostle Paul wrote to us and says, you know what? God is not yes and no. God is amen, right? God is yes. So that right there shows us maybe one of the reasons that we are stepping into the faith and we are not producing uh, or we are not seeing the result of the faith or the what we believed for we are not seeing it it's because our tongue is yes and no our tongue is amen and no our tongue is not set in one so now again this is not a condemning thing this is just a revealing thing for us to help us understand what happens. Now, let's go to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 21. Now, let's take a look at verse 4 in Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. It says, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom and um, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. So I'm going to share my screen again here with you. And I'm just going to bring a new white screen. And then here it says, okay. So they are journeyed from Mount Hor. Okay, we have a mountain here. All right. And they journeyed by the way of the Red Sea. Let's say Red Sea. So do we see? We have a mountain and we have a sea. And the soul of the people became discouraged. Where is this place? This place is in wilderness. Okay. So we have a people. I'm going to bring blue no i'm gonna bring green color so we have people here whose soul is discouraged okay so their soul their soul is discouraged on the way okay so that's really important it says on the way on the way what way they are on a way to somewhere, to a destination. They were going to go from one place to another place in order like to arrive somewhere that we know it is called the promised land. So they are on that some kind of a path here and they haven't arrived at the destination. I'm just going to make this a little smaller. Okay, so they haven't arrived at the destination here. Where was the destination? Destination was the promise land. Isn't it 
this not is this not something that James has been telling us that blessed are those who endure the temptation we already looked at it when we were in chapter one blessed are those who endure temptation for when they are approved they will receive the promise okay so look at the promise for the promised land just in order for us to understand it look at it as the promise that God has given you so now you are on the way to that promised land and it says people on the way that means they haven't arrived for whatever reason their soul was discouraged now let's take a look verse 5 and the people spoke against God and against Moses wow this is really good so let's see people now I'm gonna bring I'm gonna I'm gonna write it down and then I'm gonna show you why I did it okay so I'm just gonna do this people okay I put a snake there okay people spoke so the soul was discouraged so they spoke against God and they spoke against Moses so I'll tell you why I put the tongue as the mouth or like a serpent soon so they spoke against why have you brought us out of the land of Egypt uh, to die in this wilderness so they were discouraged that they will never arrive into the promised land they were discouraged that they're gonna die in the wilderness so why have you brought us and look at that verse uh, verse 5 for there is no food no water and our soul loath this worthless bread what bread the manna that came down it says you know what we they are so loath the worst the the this worthless bread the the reason they were discouraged is because they didn't see how valuable and how worthy and wor how worthy is that manna that came to them in the wilderness okay so one thing I want to say if you are on the way to the promised land obviously you don't want to be discouraged and obviously you don't want to speak against the promise right so but how do you do this what what do they what do we do they say we don't have we have no food and no water but here just a second let's just take a look at it they have no food and no water we are in chapter 21 God already sent the water God already gave the bread the manna and the meat and a lot of things happened since until we get to here they had food they had the water but they were looking so that did you see here they didn't want that food or that water that God, God gave them and they wanted their own water and their own king the same food that they used to have when they were in you know slavery in Egypt so so what was their food so they did have I'm gonna write down here they did have they did have the food what was it the manna they did have the water but they said you know what we don't have no food we don't have water or so low thing so that right there shows us if you don't want to be discouraged on the way you gotta start realizing and seeing probably or eating the, the food that the Lord is giving you while you are getting to the promised land I have seen this a lot in Christians that they are so you know like this promise it's so important and so big for them that they are they want to get from here from the wilderness to the promised land all the way complaining and this is not how it works 
because we're going to see what happens here. P this promised land is so important that they, after some times, they are not, they don't see themselves there. They are what? <coughs> Excuse me. They are discouraged. <coughs> Excuse me. How many times have you been discouraged? Right? If you are discouraged on the way to promised land, to the promise that you know it's yours, that right there shows me you are not eating from the food and the water that the Lord has provided for you in wilderness. Okay. Let's go to verse 6 in Numbers chapter 21, verse 6. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. All right, so I'm just going to remove my, you know, all those uh, yellow things because I don't want to have a lot of those on here. So the Lord sent, now some of you are going to say, okay, why is it saying the Lord said? Well, the people, James told us that the Lord doesn't send those kind of temptations and evils and stuff like that. So let's not get caught up to it. And let's take a look here. In the light of the New Testament and the revelation of the New Testament, we know the Lord. So now here says, so the fiery, so let's just put it this way. The fiery serpent came and they bite people and they died. Now probably know what is that fiery serpent. Let's go back to James chapter 3. James chapter, keep your finger here in Numbers, James chapter 3, verse 6, it says, And the tongue is a fire, a word of iniquity. The tongue is a fire. Now, you can just write it down here. The tongue is a fiery serpent. Okay? So now, let's just move on to, let's go back to Numbers chapter 21. After many of them died and they were bitten by the serpent, they came to... Look at verse 7. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpent from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Keep that in mind because I, in the next video, uh, well, in this series, we're going to get to a place that James says, Pray for one another. So here, Moses is praying for the children of Israel so that they can be healed and they can receive life. Look at verse 8. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be, it shall be that everyone who is, bitten by, uh, who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. Okay, now I'm just going to come to my screen here. So I'm going to put something like a cross like a lucky pole here, okay? So, this is the serpent on the pole. It says, okay, you know, they spoke against, their tongue actually, you know, bitten them. And now what you need to do, even though, even though, that has happened all you need to do is you need to look at the serpent on the pole and whoever looks they shall live okay so they they spoke against and the stink of a serpent came to their body and they got sick and they got poison in their body. And the Lord said, in order for you to escape this poison of the serpent, you need to look. Look into that serpent. 
Hallelujah. That's it? This is all I need to do? I actually spoke against God and Moses and I'm in wilderness and I was discouraged and all of a sudden you are telling me if I just take a look at this, you know, serpent on this pole, I will live? Okay, this is good. This is really good. I mean, I hope you are seeing God's mercy and love. Let's go to John chapter 3. Probably many of you are familiar with that scripture. Let's go to John chapter 3. I'm just going to remove this, um, you know, the Red Sea. I need a space here. Okay. Okay. To write down something. So let's go to John chapter 3 and look at verse... Um, 14, Jesus is talking here to Nicodemus and he says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Wow. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So what do we have here? We have serpent in the wilderness. So the Son of Man must be lifted up. Interesting, right? So this talk is talking about the cross, serpent, the Son of Man on the cross. So the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes, believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But in the context, do you see what's happening? In the context of the example that Jesus is bringing, he says that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But Moses told the people, whoever looks at the serpent that is lifted up, you shall live and not die. And here says, whoever believes in him. But now, take a look. Let's just look at, uh, look at verse uh, chapter 6. Look at verse 40. It says, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. So chapter 3 told us whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Chapter 6 told us whoever sees him and believes in him shall have eternal life. Okay, so let's come back here therefore. I'm going to bring, let me just remove this as well. Okay, so if you look, if you look at the Son of Man on the cross, right? If you see him, so the first thing is see, then you will have, then believe, then you will have life. Why is it Jesus says that if, you know, like he who, uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, why Why he's saying, so the Son of Man must be lifted up? Obviously, he's saying, you know, that serpent on the cross was referring to the Son of Man on the cross. Because this serpent who bit, who, you know, like poisoned, let's put it this way, poisoned every single man is called sin. Remember? He became sin for us on the cross. He nailed sin. He nailed the old man. He nailed it to the cross. When Jesus Christ went on the cross, he became that sin who extinct us and, you know, put his poison inside of us that caused many to die he went on the cross and now here says okay you know what generations after generations mankind have been bitten by the serpent why because the serpent reside in the tongue 
in the world. And the moment the soul of man is discouraged and it starts talking out of that discouragement, they are actually being bitten. They are being bitten by the serpent, by their own tongue. But God never came and says, you know what? You did this, you know, you got to deal, deal with it. He came and he said, you know what? Let me tell you how you can get out of it. You just need to take a look at the serpent on the cross. What happens when you look at the serpent on the cross? All of a sudden you see, oh my goodness, this, the thing that, you know, poisoned me is now on the cross, is now dead. So therefore, the tongue that speaks blessing and cursing, the tongue that speaks out of discouragement, the tongue that causes my soul to be discouraged is actually dead and doesn't have that power anymore. And then the moment you see it, and then it says you believe. Okay? But in the context of the tongue and the servant, serpent, what are you believing? In this context of the tongue and the serpent, you are actually, by seeing, you are healing up your tongue. You are becoming the tree that doesn't produce good and evil, yes and no, blessing and cursing. So that brings me to the realization of the importance of, you know, the cross of Jesus and keep looking at it. So even though this video, this video is not about how am I see, seeing, what to see and all those details that maybe you have questions, but I want you to get that content and that wisdom that is behind this teaching and the wisdom says, you know what, first of all, you're on the way. You probably haven't arrived to the promise that God gave you. So avoid discouragement. If you want to avoid discouragement, eat the manna and eat the water and the bread that God gives during the time of wilderness. Do you see the hand of God? Do you see God is feeding you, is leading you? Do you see that if you don't, you become discouraged? And the moment you're discouraged, your tongue starts complaining and grumbling. And that's the serpent talking and biting. And then James told us, wherever the tongue goes, the body goes. And then our body is following the tongue, being poisoned by the, by the serpent. And then we cry out to the Lord, Lord help us. And the Lord says, you know, you shall live and not die. Lift up your eyes from the ground where you see the serpents eating the dust. Lift up your eyes and look unto where the Son of Man is, hanged on the cross for you. He took, he became the serpent so that you can look at him and you realize that your tongue has no power over you anymore. And you can actually tame the tongue. No one could throughout all the generation, but praise God for the cross of the Lord Jesus, because we are able to tame the tongue. And doesn't matter how many times you get bitten, lift up your eyes and look. Bless you guys, and we'll talk to you in the next video. All right, family, welcome back. And such a big thank you to Rose for bringing us this tremendous revelation in looking at the fiery serpent on the cross. Hopefully that term now starts to make a little more sense to you. Let's get into it and look at these points that are important for us to understand in a really deep way. The first one is this, is that the tongue is evil because it carries both blessing and cursing. And family, I hope you get this. It's not just the because it carries cursing. We talked a little bit about this last week, but the deception from the beast in the garden was that Adam and Eve had to know 
They had to have knowledge of both good and evil. James states this several examples where he brings out how the duality of the tongue is what makes it an unruly evil, and that is full of poison. You know, he refers to it as we bless our God and we curse man. Out of it proceeds both blessing and cursing. He refers to a spring that can't have both fresh water and bitter. And so in our group last Sunday, we were talking about, and Ashley, who was with us, brought out this amazing point. She noted that snakes are animals with forked tongues. We'll show you that here. And, at, and the cunning nature of a snake is, you know, the poison that it carries. And this forked tongue that it has, able to speak both blessing and curse, like it has two tongues in one. Those are the characteristics are there for us to understand how wicked and how malevolent our words can be. You know, it's not because we, we slip and we say a bad word. That's too obvious. It's not cunning enough. It's in the subtle nature of thoughts that form in our hearts and get splashed in the words that we speak. And so the tongue is evil because of this duality. It's this fork nature that it has where it puts into motion both good and evil. Let's move on to the second point, and that's this. The commandment from God was not to eat from the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so there's really two points here. And the first one is that there is a fruit called the knowledge of the good and evil. And there is also a fruit called life. And fruit is something that gets produced from a tree. In this understanding, our tongue also produces fruit. Our tongue can produce life and it can produce good and evil, or what James calls blessing and cursing. The second very important piece to take away from this is that the thing that is getting produced is the thing that we take in to sustain or to move our life forward. That is what fruit is referring to. When God is talking about eating from these trees, the point is not about what is being physically consumed. You know, when God is talking about eating from these trees, he's speaking directly to what we take in that generates the energy by which we live by. I, I like the way that came out, so I'm, I'm going to say it again. See, when God is talking about eating from the trees, he's actually speaking directly to what we take in that generates the energy by which we live by. He's saying that the thing that you take in that is the energy by which you live by can either come be taken from life. Jesus says, I am the bread of life or it can be this duality of good and evil. Remember, it's both of them. And so when choosing what you consume that will produce the energy that moves your life forward, don't consume knowledge of good and evil. Rather, let the energy that you live by come from consuming the bread of life. Let's move on to the third point. And that is this, is that when passion for our breakthrough is greater than passion for Jesus, we will live from the knowledge of good and evil. This is so much depth in here that you're gonna to have to give careful consideration through this and think about this throughout the week. In Numbers 21, we looked at the account of the people of Israel who were en route to the promised land. They were given the promise of a new land. It was a, a land overflowing with milk and honey, but they had to get through this place called the wilderness. We've come to understand the wilderness is this gap between the place that you receive the promise so you receive the promise when you're in bondage, when you're in Egypt, and actually living in the place. That gap, that's kind of like no man's land, and that is called the wilderness. So they've been given, you know, they begin to consume knowledge of good and evil when they're in this place. The promised land is good, therefore the wilderness is bad, it's evil. That's a math equation that should never have existed in their minds. And in that alone, there's so much to think about. And the fruit that they begin to produce is untruthful. They say that there is no food and no water, and that's not true at all. They had water from a rock and they had manna from heaven in which they called worthless. So they move from the tree of life. They move from putting truth into reality with their words, and they instead consume from the knowledge of good and evil. How does that happen? It happens because their passion for their breakthrough becomes greater than their passion for God. They are now deceived. And here's, here's the shift that happens. Their pursuit becomes a transaction 
rather than a relationship with truth and life. In their words, their tongue begin to put into existence. The words begin to put into motion an alternate reality that's just not truth. And just as a side note here, this, this, is, this is cemented in biology and it is recently being discovered by some of the leading neuroscience studies that have been out there. See, dopamine is a chemical that fuels motivation in the human body. And if you create a cycle where your highest peak of dopamine is when you achieve your goal or when you achieve a breakthrough, just like the promised land, you inevitably deplete the fuel your brain needs to pursue a higher order of living. This is amazing. So the takeaway from a biological sense is that the pursuit is in and of itself the greatest reward. And I can go on and talk about this for a really long time, but here's what's important for us to know. When passion for our breakthrough is greater than passion for Jesus, we will live from the knowledge of good and evil and not the tree of life. Let's move on to the fourth point, and that is this. The fiery serpent on the pole was sin. On the cross, Jesus became sin, and we were made the righteousness of God. And so I'm going to connect these dots here because this is really the core of the teaching this week. And I'm going to move through this quickly. But in Numbers 21, verse 8, God instructs Moses and he says, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. John 3, verse 14, Jesus makes this amazing statement. He says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He's speaking of his own crucifixion, Jesus is. Moses set the ter- serpent, which represented the sin of the tongue of the people of Israel, the words that they spoke, and he put it on a pole. And anyone who looked at that serpent on the pole would have the outcomes or the effects of that sin they committed with their words would be removed. They would live and not die. Jesus says that in this same manner, I must be lifted up. And in John 6, 40, he picks up on this and he says, this is the will of him who sent me. Amazing that this is the will of God, that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. So you may be asking, how is Jesus the fiery serpent that symbolized sin of the fruit of the tongue? We see this in Corinthians 5, 21. It tells us God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us. He didn't know sin, he became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And this is the reference that Jesus makes. So as the fiery serpent represented the sin of the tongue, Jesus becomes that sin, that fiery serpent on the cross that is high and lifted up. And everyone who sees him, just like Moses, everyone that looked at the fiery serpent, everyone who sees Jesus and believes in him, they would have the outcomes of that sin completely reversed, and they will have everlasting life. And so here, the fiery serpent again, on the pole was sin, and the cross, Jesus became sin, and we were made the righteousness of God. Okay, my fifth and final point is this, and this is less about a point of the teaching and more as a point of personal message to those that are out there. I really believe that someone needs to hear this. I want you to know this. I want you to know that Jesus reverses the penalty of sin it makes you a producer of life. And so every word that has ever been spoken over you that was rooted in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Jesus comes and he removes the power of those words over your life. The words that may have come from teachers, the words that may have come from parents that were themselves hurting, the words that may have come from people and kids in school, Words that may have come from those you love and those you trust, but they were rooted in both good and evil. Jesus comes and he removes the power, the poison that those words inflicted, the reality and the outcomes that those words have produced and created in your life, and the power that those words have had over your life are immediately reversed when you look at the cross and when you see Jesus high and lifted up. Look, accepting that truth is taking the coal from the altar of sacrifice that we spoke about last week and putting it on your tongue. Sin has no power over you. The effect of missing the mark, the effect of those words spoken over you by you or anyone else 
Those words no longer rule your life. This is what it means when it says that sin doesn't have dominion over you. So now what? Now the energy that we use to carry out our lives comes from the tree of life, the bread of life. That is truth. We eat the truth, the fruit of the tree of life. And what's in fruit? Seed is in fruit. And we ourselves becomes the tree of life. And in our leaves, we carry the healing for the nations. How? By the fruit that we produce by our words. Man, that is so good. So Jesus reverses the penalty of sin and he makes us producers of life. Family, that wraps it up in this understanding of the fiery serpent and Jesus on the cross. And you may be saying, Bill, how can my words provide healing for the nations? That sounds silly. Look, Jesus was on this earth for a mere three years. And in three years, he completely resets time. You know, he changes the course of humanity. He brings heaven to earth in that time. And the only thing he ever used was his words. He is the first of many. He is the beginning and the end, and the author and the finisher of faith. All right, family, I hope that blesses you. I hope you got so much out of this. There is so much for you in this, and not just understanding the knowledge of this. Please don't take this as a study of academics. That's not what this is. This is purposeful to transform our lives, to transform our consciousness, and to have Jesus receive his reward. We love you, family. We'll see you next week, and we continue on. God bless you.